Heavenly Father, thank you for this evening. I thank you for those attending and those that will be attending. And we ask you, Lord, just to have your way. And hopefully we can learn something and maybe uh, avoid some things and, and not fall into traps. And uh, Father, so we thank you for this teaching tonight. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, this is the white knight syndrome. Something's been on my heart. Uh, it's, a, it's a problem or a syndrome that I have participated in in my life. And, and I appreciate Jim Drake. Uh, you can see him on the lower part of your screen wearing the white shirt. I think that's very appropriate. And, um, you know, if we see his trusty steed come galloping by the video window, then we shall, you know, we shall know. Um, so anyway, let's talk about this syndrome and to see what it is. This is going to be uh, it's a serious topic, actually, but a fun topic. OK, so we can be serious and fun. That's me. I'm serious, but I'm fun. OK. And if you have any, you know, puns or anecdotes or Anything you'd like to pick on Steve Whitman about, just put it in the chat box. This is perfectly acceptable. So let's define the white knight syndrome. It, it is a type of relationship that is initiated typically by a guy. It could be a woman, but I would say normally it, it's a guy. And, um, and I, I'm talking about male and female here. And um, it is when the, the, the definition of the white knight syndrome is a relationship that is based on a rescue, a relationship that is, has started and initiated with a rescue of one person rescuing the other person. So the rescuer is the white knight and the rescue E would be the damsel in distress. So. We'll call it rescue relationships. I want to talk about them and why we, why we do it, and we'll look at some answers, you know, as well. So please, if you have any comments or suggestions, uh, you know, in the chat in the chat box, and, and try to avoid the one, of, you know, Doctor Self. How are you so smart? How are you so good looking? You know, I get that so much that it just it just gets tiresome. So let's just try to keep it straight and narrow on the topic. It's a joke. Marsha's laughing. Okay. Now, the white knight thinks, if I do this, then she will. That, that, that's his thinking process. That, that's how everything starts. If I do this, then she will. So, let's look at the thinking process of the white knight. If I save her from her troubles... Now, this all seems very, very noble. You know, um, I've, I've done this. I mean, I've come into relationships, you know, in, in the past thinking that my job, my responsibility, my call is to rescue this woman from all the afflictions that she is suffering, and I am going to reap incredible, incredible rewards here on earth and later in heaven. It's just because, you know why? Because I am a hero. I am the superior one. I am the, the, the white knight. And of course, the damsel in distress is just going to swoon at my feet. Okay. And it, it's, it seems very chivalrous. It seems very, um, you know, courteous. It seems very manly. Let's get on. To, let's talk about a little, a little more detail. If I do this, she will adore me and look at me as a true hero. So I see this woman that is struggling. Maybe it's a, a, a single mom with several kids who's deeply in debt and struggling and working two jobs. Well, you know, if I come into this relationship and help her financially and and rescue her from all her troubles and trials and tribulations and father those kids for her and and teach them the right and noble way she will adore me i mean i will be worshiped like a conquering hero it, it'll be my every need will be met now this sounds this is sound are you yawning susan <laughs> you know she will adore me and look at me as a true hero if I rescue her from her obvious failings, 
then she will respect me for my great wisdom. Now, I hope you, you see that maybe we're painting a picture that may not be so pretty. Now, I know this sounds silly, but a lot of guys do this. Oh, when I was admiring myself. Oh, <laughs> listen, my wife says I'm very proud of my humility, okay? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So if <laughs> then so if I do this, she will respect me for my wisdom. This is one of my, my standard jokes. Here is what every husband wishes their wife would say this is a this is a man's dream come true it's probably a fantasy as a matter of fact i believe it is a fantasy it goes like this you talk to your wife and you correct her and you show her what she's doing wrong and how she can do things so much better and you share your wisdom with her and then your wife says honey thank you so much for correcting me and showing me a better way. I feel so much wiser now. Is there anything else you would like to tell me? <laughs> tell, tell me how that actually works. Has that ever happened in the history of mankind? Okay, I don't think so. So <laughs> it, it's, it's just, it's a fantasy, but doesn't does it generally work. If I show her a better way to live now the white knight syndrome if I just if I just show her you know there's a better way to do this here is my way let me show you the way that I think is best and let me show you what you're doing wrong and how you could be so much better than what you're doing and how you could improve your life and, and improve your situation let me show you a better way to live then she will always be grateful for my insight and my direction this is now this sounds silly but they're guys that actually think this okay and they really try to build a relationship they're rescuers and it, we can go into a little more detail you know, why do guys do this you know what are their benefits well they're thinking in their in distorted ways that you know, they're going to do these things and they're going to get these incredible reactions from these damsels in distress. They think, if I fix the issues in her life, then she'll be a much better person. Boy, she should be grateful for that. You know, if I just fix all the issues in her life and show her where she's wrong and show her how she could do it in a much more intelligent way and a much more profitable way and a much more efficient way and because I have a way that obviously is better and superior and all she has to do is just listen to me and she's going to be a much better person and you think and I'm being ridiculous but there are guys who think like this they do think like this and I can imagine right now that Susan and Marcia are probably cringing <laughs> so well oh, or maybe you have been part of this the White Knight sees all of his attempts to correct and rescue as a noble responsibility. You know, uh, <laughs> I am a man. This is my job. This is this is being noble. This is being manly. This is being um, true. This is being. This is what manhood is all about. To to rescue the poor, inferior, and helpless, and maybe worthless female and show her the better way to live and act and just show her the, the true way I will rescue her now actually what's going on inside of the white knight uh, underneath all these little characteristics generally is a low self-esteem instead of looking for a relationship that is more a person who could come along beside them and actually have a relationship the way God intended, they see their only hope of a healthy relationship is to be superior and find a damsel in distress. And these white knight guys, they will roam around looking for damsels that they can rescue. They will, they will look for them. As a matter of fact, in a way, they almost prey upon them 
thinking that they're doing something noble by rescuing them. If he thinks his actions are the manly thing, I'll keep my man card if I do this. And uh, in my life, when I was younger, I was I was a rescuer. When I was in, uh, especially I've been around from age about 25 to 35 years old in that area, I really felt it was my duty to help, to, to find a woman who needed help and to help her and to bring her out of her lower existence and because I, I knew a better way to live. And actually what I had became, became was a controlling person. I became a person who wanted to control and wanted to fix. And really, I was constantly frustrated because I, I could not control other people, but I thought it was my job to control them because I knew what was right. You know, what the Lord corrected me one day, a major correction. I'll never forget this. I, I remember the exact spot I was standing when the Lord gave me a word that changed my life. Now, this is a very simple word, but... You know, sometimes when God speaks to you, he'll say something very simple that turns out to be very profound. And he told me this. I heard him speak to my spirit, and he said, Ray, just because you're right doesn't give you a right. And I realized me thinking that I was right gave me the right to correct and fix and try to control other people. And what I was doing was I was creating a mess. I was creating uh, resentment and rejection, and frustration on both sides. It was not a good thing. Not a good thing. So he thinks that his actions are the manly thing to do, but, <laughs> but, hold your horses. <laughs> now this looks like you know, I'm going to be a, I'm going to rescue her. I mean, she needs money. She needs uh, guidance. This damsel in stress needs to, to know more about life. She needs my wisdom. She needs my protection. She needs my, uh, you know, my, my ideas. She needs, she just needs me. And, and, and because she needs me to do this, obviously she's going to worship the ground I walk on. She's going to love me. I'm going to be her hero forever so hold your horses we have a problem <laughs> how could there possibly be a problem with such a noble and wonderful gesture as to rescue the damsel in distress like Dudley do right Rescue relationships don't work. They just do not work. The thinking is, you know, if I if I look for the person who needs to rescue and I rescue them and save them, and it's, it's going to build a healthy, long-lasting relationship. And my experience has been, and actually I have experienced it in my life firsthand, they do not work. The old expression is, the job of Savior is already been taken. <laughs> All right. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't help people. We're going to talk about that. So hang, hang with me. I'm not saying as a man, you know, or this could be, in other words, this could be a woman rescuing a man too. I'm not saying that we don't do things for people. I'm not saying that at all. But I want you to, I want you to see, uh, as I get to the end, you'll see the difference. I'll show you the answer to this problem. Again, um, most men who have the white knight syndrome um, don't feel very well about themselves. And so they look for a person that they perceive living at a even, quote, unquote, lower level than themselves. And they many times when they get around healthy people who are emotionally and spiritually and physically intellectually healthy, they're very uncomfortable around healthy people because they're not comfortable in their own skin, okay? So when you feel good about yourself and you have confidence, especially confidence the Lord gives you, then you're more comfortable around healthy people, okay? But the white knight typically is not, is not comfortable around 
the women who don't need a rescue. He's only comfortable around the women who do need rescuing or they thinks they need rescuing. And it has to do with his own view of himself. And underneath it all, he doesn't view himself very well. So he has to find this person in a, quote, lower status, so to speak. All right. Why do rescue relationships not work? I'm going to get specific here. When we try to rescue a person, there is a message. You know, actions contain a message. You've heard the expression, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. I will tell you something. Your actions are worth a thousand words. You don't have to say things. You do things. And what you do speaks a lot louder even than what you say. So when we try to rescue a person, we give that person a message. Let's look at the message. You are broken and you need to be fixed. Now, who doesn't want to hear that message? I am above, you are beneath. I am smarter and wiser than you. I know better, you cannot make it without me. I am superior, you are inferior. Now, let's use a little common sense here. Can you base a relationship on this? Is this the type of relationship we want? Is this the message we want to convey? Absolutely not, but that is the message that the white knight, if he is not careful, the white knight guy who think who has that syndrome, this is the message that he's conveying. And, there, and there's other pieces of this as well. You know, I, I know more than you. Um, I, I'm much more mature than you. All these things, and when it actually is done, instead of making a partnership, it has created a breach. And typically, what happens to, to the quote, unquote, damsel in distress is she begins to resent the white knight. And she doesn't worship the ground he walks on. And she doesn't uh, appreciate everything he does. And at some point, she says, I wish you'd just go away. And see, the relationship is not based on mutual respect and mutual giving, like a covenant. You know, a covenant is where... I, I want to meet your needs 100%. And the spouse says, I want to meet your needs 100%. I want, I want to put you above me. That's what a covenant is. The covenant doesn't say, oh, you're broken, need to be fixed. I'm not broken, but you're broken. You know, you don't have it together. I got it together. I'm so much wiser. I'm so much smarter. I know how to handle things. You don't. Blah, blah, blah. Every time you do that, it's actually a put down. And after a while, the person you're trying to rescue, if you hear me, Mr. and Mrs. whoever you are, white knight, you're, you're not giving them a good message. You're telling them some bad messages and you're creating some problems and you're creating some resentment. You're not building a healthy, godly, one flesh, connected in Christ relationship. Okay, and this is, this is a lot. And I want to tell you something about the white knight. It's a very strong urge to do this. The, the man who has that syndrome feels driven to do this. He feels it's his responsibility. And I will tell you something. When I was the white knight, it felt right. It felt godly. It felt like this was what I was born to do. And I learned that the response I thought I would get wasn't there. How dare her, after I did all this for her, not adore me, want to kiss my ring when I walk in the room. How dare her? And it just didn't happen. Because I had created a breach. I had given a bad message. My motive wasn't good. The damsel in distress will begin to resent the superior white knight. See, God, the word of God says there's neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female. We're all one in Christ Jesus. God sees us all equally. He doesn't see one person greater than the other. In Christ, we're all equal. 
And this is the way we have to see. And this is what makes relationships. We're uniquely made. We're different, but we're equal. And if you're husband and wife, you're one. And you're not one above and one beneath. You are one. And this, this above and beneath, and I've got it, and you don't. That's not, that's not the way God works. He sees all his children the same. Equality. There's no racism or sexism or bigotry with God at all. Let's look at the answer. And if we could get a drum roll here. It's not going to be a very long counseling hour. Maybe a counseling few minutes here. But the answer. Drum roll. What are we to do, guys, if you're a white knight? The answer is serve her. Don't rescue her. Now, gentlemen. Mr. Knight, there is a huge difference between serving and rescuing. A gigantic difference. I'll ask my audience here. What do you think the difference between serving and rescuing is? What's the, just a few key words, the difference between a, a servant and a rescuer? What do you think? Marsha, Marsha. You must be typing because you moved your face close to the screen. <laughs> superior and humility. Yeah, yeah. Rescuing is superiority. Good, good answer, Susan. Serving is humility. Respect of choice versus control. That's a good answer, Steve. Very good. Respect of choice versus control. Well, that's excellent. Like said, what you got there, Marsha? Marsha, are you are you are you typing something? Are you typing an essay or a novel? You're waving your hands. I can't hear you. <laughs> I see you. <laughs> Don't feel any pressure. But we're waiting for Marsha Drake. So if you're listening to this on YouTube or over the internet, the whole class is waiting for Marsha Drake to give her answer. Please don't feel any pressure, Marsha. I love to do that kind of stuff. That's so much fun. So, serve her, don't rescue her. Serving is an act of love with no control, no domination, or expectations. Now, isn't that a little bit different? And, and it's not... A controller will serve looking for a change or having some expectations of a particular response. A servant or a man who serves a woman or a woman who serves a man is an act of love and there is no want of anything in return. And if there is a return, that's great. But there is no return the serving was done as an act of love, so it doesn't matter. You see the difference? Level playing ground, Marcia says, and technical difficulties, Marcia says. Um, serving is an act of love with no control. Let's, let's look at this. Here's, your, here's our synopsis. Mark 10, 45. This is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the name above all names, the King of kings and the Lord of lords speaking. And he said this, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. Why did Jesus come? He came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. It was unconditional love. And that's what God has called us to do, gentlemen. Show unconditional love. If you want to help the damsel in distress, go help her. But don't come in with an attitude of fixing, controlling. I'm superior. I'm wiser. I'm smarter. See what you can do to serve this woman with no expectations and to show love unconditionally. 
with an act with an attitude of humility this is what god has called for us to do and this is not the white knight syndrome this is a servant syndrome this is a servant of god with no expectations what can i do to help you how can i help you and it's just and it's just the way he's called us to be and it's a whole different attitude and many times gentlemen when you serve with love and you do it with no expectations and you let god handle that you'll get you'll get a response and it'll be greater than what you could have imagined because you did it <laughs> you did it with no expectation so James played white knight tonight and rescued Marcia with her technical difficulties well that's okay that's okay okay that's why he's wearing the white t-shirt um, I don't know why you know we got into this tonight but I felt like uh, well in my in my life I've run across young people middle-aged guys older guys and, and I'm just gonna pick on the guys right now because this is where I've seen it the most I'm sure a woman could be a rescuer too I've seen this syndrome I've seen people try to base relationships on a rescue and it just almost invariably it may be a work for a short period of time but it doesn't build a long-term healthy godly relationship we should serve we should help we should help the needy feed the poor um, do what we can to help people to serve people but not with an expectation not with a uh, not with superiority or I've got it together you don't I'm you know I'm right you're wrong I'm above you're beneath that's not the right attitude the attitude of a servant says you know what I'm underneath everything I'm just here to help you okay yeah that's a good point uh, Susan said it can help it can happen between siblings that's true there could be a rescuer or the probably the hero child in the family could be the rescuer you know in the families you have the hero child many times the clown the scapegoat the lost child but the hero child can feel it's their job to rescue the family to rescue the other uh, brothers and sisters but you know Christ Christ corrected Christ taught Christ um, he spoke hard words he spoke loving words he spoke wise words he rebuked uh, Pharisees and Sadducees but you know what he rebuked sinners but you know what he was also willing to all these people he rebuked and corrected he was willing to die a horrible death for them to give them an opportunity to be saved and have a relationship with God no matter what he said or did he was still willing to go to the cross that's humility that is unconditional love that is the ultimate act of love is I, I will tell you the truth I'll do what I can to help you to heal you deliver you and I'll even die for you that's servanthood and that's what Christ did and that's what he's called us to do we can't be exactly like Christ but the attitude of the servant is completely different than the attitude of the rescuer and I think and I think Susan you're right you know I'm talking about husbands and wives boyfriends and girlfriends but this could be in families you might have a rescuer you know in the church just trying to rescue their friends rescue church members uh, looking around for that and I think if you want to help people serve them and so am I trying to impress them demonstrate my superiority demonstrate my wisdom fix them because I got it together they don't or I'm just trying to be humble and help someone and that's the attitude and you can also build a relationship on that by humbling ourselves and just be willing to help. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Any um, any comments? What do you think? Have anybody been a rescuer? I don't want to pick on anybody, Jim. You've been a rescuer. Oh, he's waiting. He's, he's yeah. He has technical difficulty, but he is waving his hand. Okay. Now, please hear me. I'm not. I don't want to come across as condemning men who are rescuers you got to remember this now I'm going to defend the rescuer defend them a little bit the rescuer thinks and believes with their heart they're not bad people they really believe and I believe with my heart it was the right thing to do and at that time in my life that was the best I knew 
That was the best I knew how. I was doing what I knew. I was doing what I was raised to do, so to speak. And I believe that rescuing was noble. I believe that it was a good thing. And I didn't have a motive to hurt people. I didn't have a motive to cause resentment. I didn't have a motive. I didn't know that trying to control and fix people was not healthy. I thought it was a good thing to do. But, you know, eventually I learned. So I'm not condemning those with the, those rescuers or the white knights. No condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. However, I am warning you in love, it doesn't work and it's not a good way. The best way for relationships, for people, for the body of Christ is to serve one another. Be friends to one another. To serve without expectations is the best way. Uh, Susan says her oldest sister used it to control. Yeah. Yeah. See, that's typical of a, a syndrome because the controlling spirit does get in there. Well, if I, I'm going to do this, this, and this for you, and then I'm going to expect things, and yeah, it can be used to control. I have a, a family member that would use her money. Uh, she would rescue people in the family who needed financial help, but there was always strings attached to it. And they would use it to control. And Jim was the rescuer in the first three marriages. Oh, that was from Marsha. Marsha was the rescuer in the first three marriages. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Steve says, Marsha, two more marriages and you can catch up with the woman at the well. Boy, that's deep, Steve. Um, <laughs> no, you know, I've I've seen young people, I've seen teenagers do this, fall into this syndrome. I think to minister to the guy with the white knight, if I were to minister to them, I would start with their identity in Christ to show them who they are. And I think once the man or whoever the rescuer is, once their identity is established and they become secure in who God sees them in their identity in Christ, this desire, this need, this this uh, striving to control, I think will go away. Because they know this too. There's a there's a benefit to this. It's 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 feeding the ego. It's feeding the self esteem. It's helping to validate if I rescue and she adores me. That's going to validate me that I am someone, that I am worthy, that I am uh, a good person, that I am valuable. So it has to do with uh, the spirit of illegitimacy, actually, trying to legitimize ourselves through illegitimate ways. James or Marcia says, this won't happen. This is the best marriage ever. You guys always do look happy. You know your camera is pointed at the ceiling. I know underneath it all, you do look happy. <laughs> oh, there you are, a happy couple. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, Marsha, Marsha. Put a halo over Marsha. Um, so, I any other comments on this? So, Susan, that was good. It can be between a lot of other people. But, you know, I think knowing is 90% of the battle. And I honestly felt in my life it was my duty to do these things. I remember the overwhelming drive. I remember one relationship where I just felt that it was my God-given duty to rescue this woman. And I also felt that I remember thinking the benefits would be incredible if I did this. I mean, I wasn't doing it just out of love. I had a motivation. I kept thinking... I would be literally building the most worshipful relationship ever. And the truth was, I needed healing myself. I was not, I was not feeling good about myself. And I needed to rescue and get that response from the damsel in distress to feel good about myself. Yeah, that's right, Susan. There's always a payoff. There has to be a payoff. She says there's. Um, there's a benefit. You look, well, what's the benefit of the rescuer? And it, to me, it's, um, again, it, it feeds your man ego. 
and it, all, and it could be a woman you know, doing this. It feeds your ego, and then you really think you're going to be appreciated. And then what happens is you're frustrated. The rescuer is constantly frustrated because they don't get the appreciation they think they should get. So they end up trying harder and harder and harder. Well, I'll rescue some more. I will control some more. I will fix some more. I'll, I'll try different methods. I'll use different tools. I'll use different um, pieces. I'll, I'll try different strategies. And they just go on and on and on. What happens is the rescuer becomes very tense and wound up tight, wound up like a top. And the people around the rescuer become resentful and don't even want to be around them. And that can happen. It just, it just, it's just not healthy. Not healthy. Amen. What about discipling? Well, it's not, uh, whoa, did I do something? Did I lose myself here? Oh, I lost my screen. Discipling is not, you know, rescuing. That's simply teaching. And, and again, when I'm discipling someone, uh, I'm mentoring them. I'm not trying to, um, my attitude is not of superiority. My attitude is, you know, I'm a child of God. I'm saved by grace, not by works. I want to teach you about this God that we know. And I want to teach you how to mature as a Christian. And so teaching and sharing is not controlling. Now you can do teaching in a controlling way. But just telling people the truth and uh, imparting truth to people, and I do it all the time, it's not controlling. As long as you give them free will and freedom to choose, then you're not in the area of control. Yeah, that's the right way to do it. Yeah, so again, you know, when you... Uh, Give a little money to the homeless guy on the street corner holding up the cardboard sign and you kind of wonder if that is a, you know, are you rescuing them? Are you really helping them? Or, or, or what, what are you doing there? I think it really depends on your motivation. I had a strange thing happen to me about uh, two weeks ago. I was driving, it was kind of raining and um, I came to a street corner and there was a a guy holding up a piece of cardboard and I was thinking um, I don't know I felt like I was supposed to help him I felt like the Holy Spirit said help him and I didn't think I had any money so I drove on I didn't know what to do and then I realized that I had ten dollars in my pocket and I really felt convicted I was supposed to give it to this guy and I know people well he's just gonna buy drugs he's gonna buy alcohol I don't know, but I really felt the Lord told me to give the money to this guy. So it was very strange. I mean, I just went around the block, and I came back to the intersection where he was. And I was probably, it probably took me less than two minutes to go around this block and come back to that intersection. And the guy disappeared. He disappeared. I looked, and, and, I, and I stopped, and I looked all around. And he was absolutely gone. And I think that maybe it was a test. You know, I mean, all I can say, maybe it was a test. Maybe God was testing me. I don't know. Um, Steve says, I'd love to open an opportunity to teach with a question. If you ever get tired to being tired, just ask me, and I'll tell you how I dealt with the same situation. So sit back and want to be asked. Yeah, that's true. And, and, and very good point there. When, you, when people ask you for help, well, that's great. Go for it. But what the controller would do and the rescuer would do is they will come in to help when you're, they haven't been asked. And you know the difference between a guest and a pest is the difference between a guest and a pest is no, invitation. <laughs> and so you know, you know, would you, and I'll tell you something else, the way to help people is use the I word and say, you know what, this is what happened to me. This is what I did when I was in a situation similar. 
And you're just telling your story. This is how I got through it. Like Steve was saying, this is what this is what I feel, and this is how I solved a very similar problem. Then they have a choice to receive what you're saying or not. You're not trying to control or fix or manipulate. Steve Susan says, I always feel that regardless whether he is in need, my Lord shows me it's not about what I think. Okay? Yeah. It really isn't. His thoughts are not our thoughts. So it really isn't about what we think. It's what he thinks. Amen. Amen. That's good. So, I just believe that we, I think we can help the rescuer by maybe, like with me, if I was to help a rescuer, I might just tell them the story of how what I did and I'm not going to call them a rescuer I said you know I met this woman when I was about 30 years old and she had this problem that problem and this problem and I really felt that I could help her if I just would do this and this for her and, and I began to to invade her life and take charge of some things and do some things for her and I really thought that I was going to get a whole lot of love and respect and honor for that, but you know what? It did not work. And I realized that my motive was really not pure. I really was expecting something. I wasn't trying to serve her. You know, you can share like that. And that's not controlling. That's just sharing your story. Amen? Okay. So, help the rescuer if you see one. You know, maybe you show the truth. And the truth shall make you free. You know, uh, I wish more people, hope more people listen to this on YouTube. I really think this could be very, very helpful to a lot of guys and women and siblings and, and people in the body of Christ, even pastors. Okay, some pastors are rescuers. I'm very blessed. We have a pastor here in Orlando named... Uh, Okay, just a minute, Steve. We have a pastor in Orlando named Joe Warner who uh, is an incredible servant. Just loves to help people in practical ways. Loves to. I mean, he's just happy, but he doesn't ask for, he's not looking for, he never asks for anything in return. He just does things for people. And uh, doesn't ask for credit, doesn't ask for glory, doesn't ask for anything. He just, he's helped me in so many ways, so many people in our church, and just recently drove a whole truckload of sheetrock down to uh, Baton Rouge to help the flood victims. Didn't ask for anything. Anyway, serve it. So Steve says he has a historical gee whiz side comment. Well, Steve, what is your historical gee whiz side comment? Uh, well, since we're talking about white knights, we all recognize or remember the stories of white knights and black knights. And Historically, in the time of the White Knights, the White Knights belonged to the King's Court. And the Knights had serfs or servants of the King to polish their armor. And so the steel armor was polished continuously, and polished steel looks very reflective, it's very shiny, so it reflects light and therefore looks bright. If Knights that were not under the king did not have serfs. So what they wanted to do was to try to preserve the steel from rusting. And they did that by rubbing something like a gun black or a, a type of a darkening, like an oil, onto the metal to prevent it from rusting. And that would turn the color of the armor dark. And so it was understood that if it was a shiny armor, you belong, you work for the king, you belong to the king, and the king was always good, so the shiny armor was associated with the good, the dark armor was associated with those that were not with the king, the rebels, and the renegades. Wow. Wow. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> that is good. That is good. Well, any other comments, guys? Jim and Marcia, so good to see you. Susan, thank you for logging in. I appreciate you very much. Say hello to all my friends up in Indy and uh, Minneapolis. Or is it Milwaukee? I keep forgetting. 
Milwaukee, Minneapolis, one of those M, M cities up there. Milwaukee, isn't it? Minneapolis. See, I told you it's Milwaukee. I just want, I'm just testing you. Okay. So, anyway, thank you, Steve. Thank you, everybody, for listening. And uh, with Lord, we just thank you for this teaching. We thank you for this evening. We thank you for those that will hear it, Father. And I pray that this teaching will do some good. In the name of Jesus. So, appreciate it. And as we always say, Milwaukee Cheeseheads. I always say, good night, John Boy. Good night, Jim Bob. Good night, Mary Lou. Good night, Grandpa. Good night, Grandma. Good night, all you Waltons. Good night, America. Good night.